I want to tell you about what we've been doing uh, here at UCSD uh, really for the last uh, 15 years or so. Um, and it's really been trying to solve some of the problems that we have uh, on our planet. Uh, and I'm going to try to connect this kind of green goop here, uh, which is microalgae that we, we are able to grow locally and here on our campus, and turning them into products that people are actually going to want to buy. Um, so I think I don't need to tell everyone here that we have a problem on the planet, that we're dealing with these fantastic materials that chemists spent a lot of time and effort and did a fantastic job at making materials that would last forever. Uh, and now we're facing the problem that there are these materials that just aren't going away. And they've become ubiquitous in our lives. Uh, they're everywhere around us. Uh, as we were speaking, there was a plastic bag floating in the air uh, from the last speaker. And you know, we need to start thinking about the things that we're doing around us. I have to point out that there are recycling symbols on most of the plastics that we use. However, most of them are completely uh, a lie, right? Uh, most of those plastics are not recycled. And in fact, uh, less than 10% of the plastics that we use actually get recycled. Uh, here is a, a list of a lot of the plastics that go into the products that we use today. Less than 25% of potentially recyclable material, so this is the, the Coke bottles, the water bottles, the things that we can recycle are ever recycled, okay? So this is an enormous problem. And it's not just a problem for the planet, it's a local problem. It's, it's, it's my problem, it's your problem. We need to deal with this. Um, you know, it is a local problem because we have to use our landfills. Our Miramar landfill is filling up with this material. Our oceans are filling up with it and we need to find solutions. So one of the first things that we start thinking about is what types of materials here are recyclable, truly recyclable, and what types are actually biodegradable. Um, and it turns out that very few of them are biodegradable, really only certain types of polyurethanes and these polyhydroxybutrates are. Unfortunately, I have to tell you that all of these plastic silverware and plates that we've been using since COVID started that say that they are biodegradable, they're actually not biodegradable in a backyard compost. Um, they are biodegradable only in industrial composting facilities. So you can take that fork and put it in your backyard compost and it will still be there 10 years later. This is a problem. So how can we make changes ourselves and actually contribute it to this? Well, number one, we can stop using products that contain plastics, right? So these are things like packaged food, single-use pl uh, plastics, and to try to choose products to purchase uh, that aren't going to involve plastics that, won't get re that truly won't be recycled. Um, I also have to point out that even the recyclable plastics, the PET, uh, the, 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 one, the, the, the things that can be sent into a, a melting and recyclable system, you can only use about 10% of those in new products. That means that 80 to 90% of virgin material have to be used, okay? So, so this fallacy of recycling really uh, perpetuates in the recycling system. We need to compel companies that make plastic products to recover their products and their packaging. And this can be done at the local, state, and federal level. But the local level has to start it. You know, we made a lot of progress by changing the plastic bags uh, in our grocery stores, right? Compelling people to either buy them or use ones that are, are uh, reusable. Uh, but we need to go further and make sure that companies that are making these products, uh, that we don't have to deal with them ourselves. Um, and finally, and this is where we play a role, uh, we need to be able to develop new products that are both biodegradable uh, and ideally recyclable. Uh, and I'll talk to you about the work that we've been doing on that. And that means we need re research and product development. Uh, and we need a lot of people participating in this. And hopefully I'll be able to talk to you about that today. So of course, most plastic comes from petrochemicals. We also have a petroleum problem on this planet. If we can start moving away from petroleum and replacing those items, uh, maybe we'll start coming up with some solutions. Um, and it turns out petroleum is just ancient algae. So liquid petroleum really is algae that grew on this planet uh, millions, billions of years ago and got buried uh, under the earth and transformed with that heat uh, and that pressure into the petroleum that we know. 
So what we asked is, can we turn algae that we can grow, microalgae, uh, can we grow that here in present day uh, on the surface of the, of the earth and turn that into these types of products? And can we make products that aren't going to damage the environment like existing plastics? So we started thinking about this, uh, and we really realized that algae is a fantastic solution to some of these problems. And when I talk about algae, the work that we're doing is in the microalgae, these little guys right here, not macroalgae, like the kelp that's growing off uh, the coast here. But these are microorganisms that we can grow. What's nice about them is that we can grow them uh, on very large scales. They're extremely productive. They're 50 to 100 times more productive than vascular plants, so for example, traditional crops. Uh, it's extremely sustainable. We don't need arable land to grow algae. You can, use, uh, you can use salt water, you can use brine, you can use wastewater. Actually, these organisms love municipal wastewater that has nitrogen and phosphorus in it. It's a great way to clean up the water before we send it uh, off the coast and into the ocean. These are programmable. We can actually program the biosyntheses in these organisms to make the types of molecules that we want. And there are people who are looking at microalgae as a potential form of food, if nothing else, for animals. It's actually very uh, excellent protein for animal feed, and people are actually eating it too. Um, and it's not too bad, I'll, I'll say that. Um, but it turns out that agriculture is, is biomanufacturing, and algae is agriculture. So the, the company that was able to, to do this work at the largest scale was called Sapphire Energy. This was a San Diego company. Um, although they had their farm was in southern New Mexico, and here they had 100 acres covered in raceway ponds to grow algae. Uh, and this was a success uh, that I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, so we created the, the first the, the San Diego Center for, for Algae Biotechnology back in 2008. And as we started to grow, we, we brought other people in from California. Um, we've now become the California Center for, for Algae Biotechnology. And all along the way, we've gotten great funding from the Department of Energy. Uh, most recently, we've got about $9 million of funding from the Department of, El of Energy to really start to turn some of these ideas into realities. Um, so we began by, by creating an algae farm on our campus. And we can do this. It's actually probably the most expensive farmland uh, in this country. Uh, it's on the northern side of, of the campus, right behind where uh, the police and the, um, and the buses are stored, uh, right along the I-5. And we have a facility where we can grow the algae. So we can grow it in greenhouses and these things that we call hanging bags. Um, that holds about 100 liters of water. We can move to these larger, what we call mini ponds. Those are 800 liters of water. And all of this is designed to be very inexpensive. So this is actually a cattle trough. It's used in farming to, to feed animals. And here we can bubble in carbon dioxide and whatever we need. Uh, and finally, these are the, the, what we call raceway ponds. Uh, and this can hold about 8,000 liters. And we have two of these on our campus. And so we're really able to scale things up and bring them to, very, to, to fruition in terms of making prototype products. So back at the beginning, we were focused on biofuels. Uh, and this is a group of undergraduates who are working with us. They actually made a, an entire barrel of biodiesel out of algae. Uh, and that was taken out and used. Some students actually put it into a motorcycle and ran the ba Baja 500 with it. Um, and we showed that it was successful. Um, these same types of fuels were used in cars, used in planes, used in boats. It was demonstrated that we can grow algae in real time and turn it into fuels. And it turns out that this, it works. So we have the technologies right now to turn microalgae into fungible fuels that can be used. This is no longer a scientific problem. This is a political problem, right? Sapphire Energy was able to make a gallon of gasoline for $8 a gallon back around when it was cost around $5 to $6 a gallon in California. So you would think the economies of scale would take care of that. This is no longer a scientific problem. Uh, and it turns out that we had a little uh, economic problem while we were doing this project. And right around 2014, we saw this huge dip in the price of a barrel of oil. Uh, it went from over $100 a barrel at its lowest point down to about $30 a barrel. And this is back when the Saudis increased the oil production and we had fracking going on all over the country. Um, not only this, did this uh, affect you and me, but it affected the entire renewable energy field in this country. Pretty much all the companies that were doing it went out of business. 
When our grants ran out, we couldn't get new funding for it because there was no more interest in it in Washington. Uh, and that's when we decided, you know what, we kind of solved this problem. Let's move on to other things that come from petroleum. Um, can we move up to, to more high value products? Um, so oil is the cheapest commodity on the planet. Gasoline is cheaper than, than bottled water, at least cheaper than Evian. Um, and there are other things that you can use. You can feed cattle. Can we start making other types of high value products from growing our algae? And so that's what we started to do. So we created the Center for Renewable Materials to focus on taking our algae uh, and using it to make these products. And what we realized at the time was that this can't just be a scientific effort. We need everybody involved because if we make new materials, we need to get those materials into products and products that people actually want to buy. So we decided, number one, we were going to focus on making prototype products that, that people could see and, and touch and feel and want. That means we needed artists involved, we need designers involved, we need to educate, we need to teach people about these issues and spread the word that there are alternatives. And finally, we always committed ourselves to always focus on making plastics that can be biodegradable and aren't going to persist in the environment. Um, so that's what we did. We decided to focus first on polyurethanes, and that's because they're extremely broad in terms of their application. So polyurethanes can be used in things like paints and coatings. They can be used in adhesives. We have flexible polyurethanes like in shoe soles, rigid polyurethanes like in insulation uh, uh, or surfboard, uh, surfboard cores. So this is where we started first. Um, so the way polyurethane is made is you have two parts, an A and a B that come together, uh, the diisocyanate reacts with the polyols and cross-links it, and that makes a polyurethane. So you start out with these kind of clear liquids, and you get this wonderful foamy stuff when you're making uh, either a flexible or rigid foam. Um, and so we started to see if we can start creating these, these types of precursors from algae. So the first thing that we did was we tried to make a rigid foam, and this was actually a master's student in my lab who took the, the, the oils that we were using for biofuels, and he was able to show by doing some oxidation chemistry that he was able to make a really nice rigid foam, and it looked really promising. So we turned to a company just down the street called Arctic Foam that makes surfboards, uh, and we said, hey, would you guys like to, uh, to make some surfboards out of algae? And they said, cool, dude, let's do it. So we did that. It took about a year and a half of optimization. I liken it to cooking. You're basically taking the elements, all the different ingredients that go into it, and start repeat, uh, replacing those one at a time until you get something that has the consistency that you're looking for. But of course, you have to change lots of elements. If you want to take the flour uh, that you has in your favorite chocolate cake and replace it with the, uh, replace a wheat flour with a rice flour, your chocolate cake is going to be very different the first time you make it, and you need to change all of the elements. And we were able to do that very rapidly with the power of chemistry, analytical chemistry, and organic chemistry to figure out the best way to do it. So at the end of about a year and a half, we had a really nice formulation, and we were able to make surfboards with it with Arctic foam. I was going to bring a surfboard, but it was a little too big to bring on the bus. So, uh, but I brought a little piece of surfboard if anybody wants to touch it uh, after the talk. So these were the surfboards that we made back in 2015. We made a handful of them originally. One of them we gave to our former mayor, Kevin Faulkner. This is Rob Machado, a famous surfer. And this is my colleague, Steve Mayfield, um, uh, that uh, we had this, this really nice event where we actually gave away that surfboard to the city. I don't know where it is now, but uh, maybe it's in Kevin's garage. Um, OK, so we worked on rigid foams. Could we make flexible foams? And that's when we set out to do that. It turns out that this was a lot more challenging than we thought. And what we found out we actually had to do was take the fatty acids from the algae and break them down into smaller pieces, homogenous pieces, that we could then build back up using, using careful chemistry. And so I won't belabor the organic chemistry, but that's exactly what we did. We were able to make these dye acids and condense them with renewable uh, intermediates, and we made the world's first flexible polyurethane from algae. Um, and these looked really promising. They had really great uh, characteristics. And in fact, those are what went into the flip-flops that I'm showing uh, right here on the table in front. Again, you can come take a look at them. These are flip-flops that are uh, about 65% renewable, because that's just because they have the algae portion in the polyol side, so the B side. Um, but they are 100% biodegradable. 
Now, we realized that we needed to tackle the A side as well, the diisocyanates. Um, it turns out that there is no renewable diisocyanates available right now, uh, and there weren't then, and we came up with a chemistry to do exactly that. Um, and what's kind of fun in the lab, we, we did a lot of things, what we call DIY, so we kind of built them ourselves. These are homemade syringe pumps that we built by 3D printing. The students really love this. Uh, and we were able to show by hooking this up to an Arduino and controlling the reactions that we were able to make diisocyanates. And it tur turned out to be a really effective method and something that we think now will allow us to get to 100% renewable materials. And that's really what we're pushing for now. When it comes to the biodegradation, we also started those studies. So these are the, the polyurethane foams in both soil and compost. And after about 12 to 16 weeks, they, can, they degrade by more than 50%. Um, and at the end, at this, these particular samples, at the end of, uh, of 20 weeks, they were completely gone. And these are being completely biodegraded by the microorganisms inside them. They're not turning into microplastics. Uh, the organisms are using these car the carbon in these um, molecules uh, as their food. And so more recently, what we've done is go into these uh, soil and compost. We, we first do uh, metagenomic sequencing to find the organisms that are there, identify those organisms. And now we're starting to pull out those organisms, sequence their genomes, and find out exactly how they do it. So what are the genes that are responsible for the enzymes that are biodegrading these foams? Um, we can then make use of that information to either make foams that degrade more quickly or alternatively, we can use those enzymes to biodegrade the foams in a recycling kind of condition. Uh, and that, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, another thing that we do is we isolate those organisms. So we'll take uh, a liquid culture from our, um, our biodegrading compost, and we'll do passaging to try to separate. You have a large consortium of organisms, but as you start passaging them, you get them smaller and smaller and smaller, and you're actually able to separate them for each other, from each other. And as long as they continue to biodegrade the material and use that as a food source, we can eventually isolate each individual organism. Um, and this is a, what it looks like. So this is what our, our polyurethane foams look like in an electron micro, uh, scanning electron um, microscope. So here you see kind of smooth surfaces. And here they're being biodegraded by the organisms. So up there are bacteria munching away on them. These are filamentous fungi that are settling in uh, and eating their lunch. So um, really exciting to be able to demonstrate this at all levels. And I'll just say, um, when we started doing this, it was dogma that polyurethanes are not biodegradable. Um, and that's really because the good uh, scientists, the, the, the chemists and engineers, basically engineered that quality out of these products in around the mid-60s, because they saw degradation as being a property that they wanted to avoid. Um, so really what we're doing is recapturing that, and we're able to find some really exciting science all along the way. Um, more, very recently, we've been taking our foams and putting them in the ocean water. So here we have them tied to the end of Scripps Pier. Uh, and over the course of three months, we basically see these things almost completely biodegrading. It's a little bit slower than in compost, which has an elevated temperature. But we've been able to show that they're, they're actually unique organisms in the ocean, but they're also biodegrading these foams. And this is actually a paper that we just uh, submitted for review uh, a couple of weeks ago. So our long-term goal is to have these two cycles where we can grow the algae and make products that people use. And then when, at the end of their life, when they're done with them, um, they can put them into a compost and they will completely biodegrade. And I want to say it's important to note that these are durable materials. So they should last as long as any other type of product that you would have. Um, but then at the end of the day, they will biodegrade very rapidly and just be turned back into carbon dioxide by the microorganisms that eat them. We hope that alternatively we can create a parallel strategy where these can be recycled, where we can actually take these products, they can get used, and then we can break them down by those enzymes that I said that we're capturing from sequencing the organisms. And as we learn about them, we can then scale up these processes, processes to do a chemical recycling, where we break the monomers down and isolate them and remake these materials. In this case, you should be able to use 100% of the products um, because they can be completely broken down to their, their monomers. 
Um, and lastly, we realized that we needed to turn these into to real products that people could buy. And we realized that we weren't going to manufacture shoes at UC San Diego. So uh, Steve Mayfield and I and Skip Pomeroy spun out a company called Algenesis Materials. There we trademarked uh, these polyurethane, so Laic, um, and we developed these shoes with, with partners uh, who came from the shoe design uh, industry. So our, our uh, president, Tom Cook, actually originally came from Vans um, and uh, helped us design these shoes. Um, and we're really excited about these. So these only launched two weeks ago, so they, they're now commercially available. You can snap that QR code if you're interested in purchasing one. But these are, um, these are made, the bottom is made of our polyurethanes that are 65% renewable. They are 100% biodegradable. The top is made from a hemp and tensile blend. Again, 100% biodegradable. Uh, and that was not easy, right? Because typically you, the threads would be made from a polyester that's not biodegraded. And of course, I've already talked about the polyurethanes. So we're really excited about these. I have some up here that uh, you all can come when I'm finished uh, and squeeze them and touch them and, and, and also take a look at the other products we're working on. So we have um, this thermoplastic material. So this is based on the renewable isocyanate chemistry. This is now 100% renewable. Uh, it is about 75% algae content and is completely biodegradable. So you could imagine making a cell phone case out of this, a watch strap something like that. And we're working towards making those types of prototype materials. We also have 3D printed filament. And something we got very recently is a coated fabric. So we're coating the fabric with these TPUs, um, th excuse me, thermoplastic polyurethanes. Um, so you could imagine having something like a rain jacket or uh, a computer bag made out of this. And again, it should be completely durable. But when you're done with it and it goes in the compost, it will completely biodegrade. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank my colleagues, and I'd like to thank you all for your attention.